Okay, hello everyone. I want to thank you for listening and watching this. Uh, so what I've put together here is just a sample lecture of a class that I'm putting together called Organic Chemistry and Medicine. And what I'm attempting to do is design this class specifically for pre-med nursing and biology students. Um, the material is the exact same, uh, what would say, I guess just the, the material is the same that you would get in any organic chemistry class that's taught at the universities. The only difference is it's the way it's packaged or, or contextualized. This class is specifically coming from uh, a medical standpoint, and as you'll see as this lecture progresses, it'll make a bit more sense. So I've just made some common observations that I've noticed that um, organic chemistry is a course that everyone has heard of and many people dread taking it. It's a make it or break it class. Uh, it sometimes will keep people from getting into medical school and it can be a pain in the you know what. So I figured and I asked myself, does it actually have to be this way? And I realized, no, it doesn't. Um, it can actually be taught specifically for uh, the majority of the students that will be taking this. And if you look at the cross-section, a lot of students are pre-med, nursing, biology majors that need this class to ultimately go on to what they want to do. So I figured, why not mm, set it up uh, so it kind of caters uh, towards the vast majority of students that take this course. So if we just look at these definitions here, the main reason I put it on here was just to see that the field of medicine and chemistry, organic chemistry specifically, are more interrelated than one might initially assume. That you can see that these definitions talk about disease, the body, and carbon containing compounds. So all of these really mesh well, although on the surface it seems as though they're two separate different subjects that are taught. There really is more uh, of a harmonious uh, grouping between the two. So just like in, if we look at medicine, um, it has a specific, I guess, algorithm that you could say that one would go through a physician. Organic chemistry has a similar one. So in medicine, a patient will come in and present with various symptoms. Uh, and the physician will take a thorough history and physical exam. And from that, we'll come up with a differential diagnosis, a variety of diseases that they might think that the patient might have. From that, they'll order their labs and procedures, and then once they get those results back, can then combine them with the differential diagnosis and come up with what they believe is the diagnosis, and then from that can treat the patient. Now, the, the way organic chemistry is done in the research laboratory is very similar. Reviewing the literature can be looked at as like the history and physical exam. One wants to go through and see what has been done, what hasn't been done, what can be done, and what cannot be done thus far. From that comes up with a synthetic strategy, a variety of different synthetic pathways which is similar to the differential diagnosis. From that we'll come in and run, run a lot of model reactions just to see what chemistry will and will not work on the substrates of interest, the various uh, molecules of interest. And then from that uh, the chemist will then synthesize the molecule which can be uh, looked at in terms of the diagnosis and treatment. So these lectures, uh, the format will be uh, essentially based on a presentation of a case and we'll move from there. So for example, we could say a 24-year-old female presents to the ED with such and such and such. From this, then we start to move out in terms of what is the functional group or the reaction that that, that case study, that we're going to base that case study on and go throughout the lecture. Um, and then obviously once we get this function group, how does this relate to the reaction um, of the, uh, to the disease? So when one typically thinks of medicine, they think of really the gross forms of the physical anatomy, the muscles, the tendons, the nerves, um, really the, the gross forms, uh, this real visual image. Um, as well as laboratory val values that one would get from blood and, and urine and so forth. So it's really, you could think of medicine as really like a, a big picture. But then if we move a little bit inside of that and change our perspective just slightly and go to biology, it's almost as though now we're zooming in a bit in terms of our, our uh, perspective. Now we're really looking at groups of reactions, groups of substrates within the body that interact and do certain uh, chemistry and, and things uh, allow the organs to function, for example. 
But if we zoom in just a bit more, now we get to chemistry and specifically organic chemistry, where now we're looking at not groups of reactions, but a specific starting material. We want to add specific reagents, and then we're hoping to get a specific product. Now out of these, they're really just different perspectives of the same thing. So it's really you could narrow your focus or you could broaden your focus, but we're really essentially talking about the same thing. And what I'm hoping to relay is to show you is that medicine and organic chemistry are much more interrelated than one would initially assume. Although they're taught separately, what I'm hoping to do here is in a sense kind of combine the two and show you that really you can tease out uh, various orga organic chemistry concepts and show that they, they really are important um, within medicine as well as medicine is important and vice versa. So we may as well jump right in. This is kind of how it's, uh, the class is going to be presented. So in this case, we have a 30-year-old man is evaluated in the emerging department for complications of difficulty breathing, chills, and chest pain for the past 24 hours. He denies any previous history of medical problems. On physical examination, he appears ill. His temperature is 40 degrees Celsius, which is 104 degrees Fahrenheit. His blood pressure is 90 over 50. His heart rate is 110 per minute. Cardiac examination reveals a 3-6 diastolic murmur. However, the patient denies any history of a murmur. ECG results are normal. So initially, you might be thinking, what in the world does this have to do with organic chemistry? But we'll get to that. So from this, the diagnosis is acute endocarditis. Now what we want to discuss is, how does endocarditis in any way, shape, or form relate to organic chemistry? And what we can do is we can look from the perspective of the treatment of endocarditis. So on this slide, we've got a variety of different drugs that are used to treat various specific forms of endocarditis. You can see we've got vancomycin, we have penicillin, ampicillin. But when we specifically focus in on compounds such as penicillin, ampicillin, oxacillin, if you look in the middle of those structures, you'll see there's a four-membered ring with a nitrogen in it and a carbonyl compound. Um, and if we zoom in on penicillin specifically, that's what's known as a beta-lactam structure. And really you can see from this that that's an amide structure. We have our nitrogen bonded to a C double bond O, which is a carbonyl, which is essentially an amide functional group. Now it's this specific area in the middle of this lactam that is involved in the mechanism of action of penicillin. But first we have to look at what does it actually bind and react with. So there's these penicillin binding proteins are involved in the final stages of the synthesis of peptidoglycan. So it's a major component of bacterial cell walls. This is essential to cell growth, cell division. And if this is interrupted in any way, it can eventually lead to cell death and lysis. So the way this works is within that huge protein that we just looked at, there's a, a serine residue. And the serine molecule, the amino acid, is shown in the box on the top on the left. So that's hidden within there. And this penicillin molecule, as it moves in closer to the serine residue, it fits in there perfectly. And that hydroxy group comes in. And there's a nucleophilic attack on that beta-lactam carbonyl, pushing electrons up on the oxygen, giving us a tetrahedral intermediate, which then collapses. And at this point, rather than kicking out the serine group, it now kicks out the nitrogen and ring opens that beta-lactam. And now we have a covalent bond which is now an ester functional group. So what's nice about biology is they have these situations, they have these huge biomolecules that fit these substrates perfectly, almost like a lock and key mechanism where the, the reactions are performed as in an energetically favorable uh, situation as possible to give these products. Unfortunately, it's not the case in a chemistry laboratory. Although, uh, as a synthetic chemist, we wish it would be that way, it isn't. So how do we go about doing chemistry, which nature does so elegantly, in a lab setting? Well, what we have to do here is we actually have to do this stepwise fashion. So if we look at the penicillin molecule and we hone in on really the functional group that's, that's most important in this mechanism of action, it's the amide group which is a C double bond O bonded to a, a nitrogen compound. Now in this case I've got NH2, but these could be R groups, uh, carbon groups, so they don't have to necessarily be hydrogens. Now if we go to the left-hand side, we've got an acid chloride, an anhydride, and an ester, 
All of these can be used to form a variety of amides. And then at this stage, we can pull all the spectroscopic data that we need. And then we can take this amide on and we can do reactions with it to get various other functional groups. So how do we do that? So some of the groups that we can use are nitrile groups, acid chlorides, anhydrides, and esters. And when we add specific groups, uh, starting materials, as you can see, we all get the same product, the amides, and then we get some byproducts, um, which inherently in this case aren't really necessary. But the reason those are written is just in organic mechanisms, uh, synthetic chemists or organic chemists uh, keep track of all the atoms uh, so they better understand the chemistry. So in this case, if we go to the mechanism of one of these reactions, let's just take the acid chloride treat with ammonia, then we can form the amide and ammonia chloride. So we start with the acid chloride, and we treat that with ammonia, the NH3, and that attacks the carbonyl compound of the acid chloride, pushing the electrons up to the oxygen. And simultaneously, there can be a proton transfer from the NH3 up to the oxygen, now giving us the intermediate structure. Um, which has the OH, the chlorine, and the NH2 bonded to the same carbon. Now at this stage, what we have is we can use our second ammonia that we've got in there, which is labeled now blue, can come in, deprotonate, collapse our tetrahedral intermediate, giving us the amide, and now you can see our ammonia chloride. Now I just put in this box just to kind of demonstrate um, the difference in leaving groups. So if the ammonia were to come in and grab the hydrogen and collapse the tetrahedral intermediate, it can either kick out the chloride or it could kick out the ammonia. Now obviously in this case we know it's not going to kick out the, the nitrogen because that would give us the initial product that we had which wouldn't make any sense. But the reason that chlorine leaves is because it's such a good leaving group and good leaving groups as we've discussed before are groups that can stabilize a negative charge very well. So when that chloride kicks out it's a Cl- minus. it can stabilize that much better than an NH2. Now we can just look at one more mechanism here of the nitrile, treating that with water under acidic conditions um, gives us the amide in these two different structures. So in this case, we can think of a, uh, this cyanide group or nitrile group, the c bond N, almost as a carbonyl group, but it's, it's more, more reactive in a sense we could look under these acidic conditions. So what can happen here is that proton can begin to associate with the lone pair on the nitrogen of the cyano group. Water can then attack the carbon group, which pushes the electrons up and forms a formal bond now with the nitrogen and the hydrogen. And now at this case, at this point, the water you can see has three bonds to it, which gives us a positive charge. That hydrogen now can leave. And then at this stage, the other hydrogen now can get transferred from the oxygen to the nitrogen. And when that hydrogen comes off, you can think of this as also kind of like a tetrahedral intermediate collapses in a sense, collapses putting the negative charge on the nitrogen, and then that nitrogen can grab that hydrogen, giving us our amide structure. Now what I've got in the box here is just to show that anytime you have an acid catalyzed mechanism or reaction, in the mechanism, if you use the acid, you have to regenerate the acid. It doesn't necessarily have to come from the same source. As you can see here, our initial proton is, what is it, purple, and that when it's regenerated, it's uh, blue. All it's demonstrating is that there is a step in there where we regenerate our, cas our acid because it's catalytic. Now from this, we've got our C13 NMR and IR of our amides. Um, so you can see here in our C13 spectra, our carbonyl compound shows up around 180 ppms, and our alkyl group comes up around 20 ppm. So this is just um, acetamide. It's not much to it. And then with IR, IR spectra, carbonyl groups show up around 1,700 centimeters, and our NH group uh, shows up around 20 ppm. So just to go over this, the carbon 13s, what it does is it, it gives you specific values for all the carbons in the molecule, and the IR is specific for the functional groups. So we could see, like for example, you can see here where the, the C double bond O is, the carbonyl group. We can see where the NH protons are. And just to kind of correlate this, physicians obtain laboratory values and perform diagnostic tests to kind of understand the patient and the disease. And organic chemists obtain spectroscopic data and perform model reactions so we can better understand uh, the chemistry. So from this, what compounds can we make uh, from the amide functional group? So if we start from the same amide, which is just acetamide, 
We can treat it with a variety of different conditions, water under acidic conditions, lithium aluminum hydride, or bromine and sodium hydroxide. And we can either get a carboxylic acid, an amine, or in both cases we get an amines. And you can see the, the second case, all of our carbons that were initially in the amide are still present in the final product. But in the last case, you can see we've lost one of our carbons as, as carbon dioxide. So what you might be asking yourself is, or if you remember from your biochemistry class or one of the biology classes, you'll notice that amides are pretty prevalent um, in biology, um, where the amide bonds are really the backbone of uh, amino acids. It's a peptide bond. Amino acids stringing together gives you the peptide bonds, which gives you the proteins. Um, and nature's pretty smart in terms of utilizing this. That's why I said initially that nature just inherently and the way that it designs molecules is, is beautiful um, and incredibly elegant. Uh, and we try to attempt to do that in the lab, uh, but unfortunately we don't have the, the tools nor the whatever you want to call it to be able to do that. But, but what nature has realized is that these amide structures are very stable for this reason and that you can take the, you can form resonance structures where you can take the lone pair on the nitrogen, you can push it down, forming a double bond, which then pushes the electrons from the carbonyl up on the oxygen, and one of those hydrogens that was initially on the nitrogen can get transferred to the oxygen. And now what we've got is this resonant structure, these tautomers that can go back and forth, and it gives us this structure on the top right, which really you can think of as this negative charge that's going back and forth. Now the reason this is important is because what we want with carbonyl groups is we want a, a partial positive charge on that carbon of the carbonyl, which gives rise to a uh, great electrophilic character where nucleophiles can come in and attack. Now we've souped up the negative charge on there, so the partial positive isn't as great, which doesn't allow uh, nucleophiles to come in as readily. Although we can uh, react with amides, um, for example, if we look at the body, you know, the, the stomach acid is great at hydrolyzing amides. Hydrochloric acid is very, very strong acid, so you can see the conditions to actually break those apart are pretty harsh. So I've already alluded to this, so if you take uh, amides and amino acids are very important. So the amino acids, essentially there's this core backbone structure that, are, that is drawn in the black. And then we've got the side chains, that's really where the variance is. So on the bottom I've got alanine, arginine, and lysine. And these groups, uh, depending on the, the order that they're strung in, 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 can give you a variety of different protein structures. Um, and as you can see here, if you string these in, in a certain sequence, you can essentially get a variety of different structures, such as the penicillin binding proteins, which we've seen, the G-coupled protein receptor, receptors, and sodium-potassium channels.